Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson, and we're on location in Eugene, Oregon, in a straw bale studio. My guest today is Melanie Rios. Thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you've gotten involved with peak oil. Well, you knew about it a long time ago. Tell me about how that happened. Let's see, I was taking a class um, in college with Dana and Dennis Meadows, oh. and they wrote a book called Limits to Growth. And Basically, it's not just oil, it's a lot of resources. And they also talked about CO2, the prediction for CO2 in the atmosphere. How long ago was this? I mean, 30 was years ago. 30 years, okay, years ago. So we're looking in the 70s here. Yeah, and you... basically they predicted pretty accurately what was going to happen. And sure enough, it's happening. So what did that motivate you to do? Or did you take it, you know, just take it in? And how does basically, that Basically, I've your life? lived a life of voluntary simplicity. I've always lived in community and done mm. income sharing and... Live very, very simply, as much as you can in this culture. It's tough. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, you bet it is. <laughs> consume, 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 yeah. right? Everywhere you turn. And then I found a lot of um, happiness, I think, from living with other people and finding low, low footprint ways to mm. walk in the world mm. with happiness. Mm. So did that bring you to Eugene? or? It did. Um, I got stuck in Arlington, Virginia for way too long, raising a family and living community there. And then... Um, at one point, I realized I could get free, and I was called to Eugene. It's got plenty of rain. I was raised in Seattle, so I knew I loved the rain, mm -hmm. and it's going to be really important as peak oil fits have water. to have water. I yes. think it's an, uh, another really important resource. Yes, yes, for sure. So how long did you, ago did you come That here? was only four years ago. Really? Yeah. Well, then you made a really... Well, Eugene has more than that. I mean, it's a really rich place, mm -hmm. I, I could see. What else... What else have you seen now that you've been here? That, that Basically, I was an oddball in Arlington, Virginia. I washed out my plastic bags, and I didn't have a regular professional job. I taught violin in my home, or I did daycare or something. And I always felt like people thought I was weird. And when I come to Eugene, not only am I not weird, but I'm like not even on the left fringe of <laughs> the ecologically minded. I mean, I have friends here who won't even step inside a car. Really? To you okay. know, they just won't okay. do that. So, you know, I'm I'm. I'm called further to live more simply, and I'm also with like-minded folk with whom to create and create a life. So what have you been creating? Have you, has there been a response in your community about peak oil? We've had some. About two years ago, I'd say, I read the As the World Burns by Michael Rupert, and I was scratching my head. I couldn't quite connect the dots. It all made sense, but he was making some logical leaps, and I invited a whole bunch of people to my living room to just discuss it. And thinking it would be a one-time event, but we kept talking for the mm -hmm. next year or so. Mm -hmm. And what's he saying? Give me a nugget of what... what well, is... just the, how the economics are tied in, that we may have an economic collapse mm -hmm. and... Mm -hmm. um, As we have less energy, I mean, gasoline, less oil products, right? right. So it's going to affect everything in our right. community. And also okay. the connection with China, and there was just, it was so complex. And in response to that, I had a little rental house. I sold that and put that all into the mortgage here and, mm -hmm. you know, further... To, to reduce your debt. To reduce right. debt, right. right. And, Which is um, so smart. And then every week I find some new way of simplifying, you know, either now we don't use toilet paper, we use this little bidet. And every week it's something different, <laughs> but it's kind of fun. It sounds like an, you're making an adventure yes, out of it. Yeah. Out of fun. And, and you, have, you have children. I do. And so how are they responding to this? You know, it's funny. <laughs> they kind of go, oh, yeah, Mom, because we talk about it so much at home. But then it turns out at school they're the peak oil experts. Oh, really? <laughs> and and, and, and do, you, do you feel like they're sort of getting how that's going to affect their future? I think so. I think that we're all pretty much of a positive-oriented family, so they're not, like, scared about it as much as, like, my older son is not going to college. He's becoming a wilderness guide and learning how to survive in the woods and uh -huh. okay. that kind of stuff. Excellent skills know. to learn. Right. Now, you've been training yourself in some skills, too, right, in permaculture and mm -hmm. other things and mm -hmm. teaching us. Tell us about that. Right. So I've been working out for the last, this will be the third year at Lost Valley Eco Village and Permaculture Design Course. And Wait a minute, let's take it slow. Eco Lost Valley, Valley Eco Village and Permaculture Design Course. It's a two month program. Uh -huh. About 20 students come in from all around the world, really. Really? And they study together. And I work in the social end of it, how to help this group of people that come in and don't know each other and kind of acculturate them to the Oregon ways of being together which I could describe later. Yeah, what are <laughs> some of the Oregon ways well, it's, it's, of being? It's probably all up and down the West Coast. It's where, um, I guess one piece of it is transparency, where people don't hide what's going on uh -huh. for them emotionally. Another piece is okay. comfort with physical, non-sexual touch. Contact, okay, right. that's nice. Um, what else? 
I guess living simply and living one's true values as mm -hmm. opposed to what you think you're supposed to be or what okay. your parental programming is. Which I would think would be, you know, I mean, it, permaculture. Give us, give us a little nut, nutshell on what permaculture is and thus where the social part fits in. You tell me. So the principles of per permaculture is care for the earth, not abstractly, but really concretely where you live mm -hmm. and care mm -hmm. for the people around you. And there's a whole bunch of kind of left-brainy principles about... Um, using biological inputs and oh, stacking functions where you get things working efficiently. It's pretty science oriented, really. But what I hear but it's, there, the but bottom it's, line is caring. It's caring and it's directed towards how can we live off the land where we really are, even here in this urban area, how can we really truly relocalize? And that takes the pressure off of the wilderness areas and off the farmland. Mm -hmm. If we mm -hmm. can densify in the cities, that's my job because that's where I happen to live. Country folk would have a different task, probably, how to grow food for their local cities. You know, what kind of protein can they provide? There's all kinds of issues for people to deal with. I would. So, are you starting to experiment with trying to live in your urban area? I mean, we're in a suburban neighborhood. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that I challenge. grow a lot of my produce right out here. You'll be able to see a tour later with my partner, Rob. So, for, and do you put it up? Do you dry it or can it or... Or Actually, we live a in a good part of the year. We grow or? all year round. Do the you? winter gardening is fabulous around here. It grows. You have to start it in the late summer so it has a chance to grow. But mm -hmm. then it just mm -hmm. is your refrigerator is the ground. We eat greens all year round: lettuce and kale and tons of food, That's onions fabulous. and garlic That's, and everything. That is fabulous. Yeah. It's. Do you have any animals? Is it mm -hmm. just we have chickens and they provide a good bit of my protein, protein and they basically eat. The garden scraps and the, my kitchen scraps. So in that, that's part of that using everything, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that small footprint. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me, what else are you doing that interests you broadly in this in this area? What you bring to the? What I'm most excited dance? about right now is a um, a venture with my music partner. I'm a musician. We play gigs out a couple times a week, and um, how to broaden it from just being on the stage, doing something in the the app the audience passively receives it. What okay. I want to do is turn it around and erase the boundaries between the audience and the, um, and the um, entertainers. S and, and the theme is, what can people do with each other? It really doesn't matter what, because there's so much to do on behalf of themselves and the planet. And so it starts out with a whole lot of um, ideas, like this group is doing this and this group is doing that. And then a very quick toolkit of, okay, you've got your group and you've got your idea. How can you work together so that you're likely to stay together and get something done in a joyful way? Whoa. I mean, what you're talking about is good, healthy group work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see that not just in the peak oil movement, but probably in our culture at large, is how do you get a group of people who haven't worked together to do something constructive, get along with each other, or at least learn how to communicate. Do, do you deal with the communication skills? Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have lots of favorite mentors. Marshall Rosenberg is one of them with nonviolent communication. Brad Nonviolent non non communication, communication is one toolkit. Brad Blanton is the first one I ran across. He wrote a book called Radical Honesty. There's um, a couple of women that wrote a book called Undefended Love. And I forget what their names are, but that is a beautiful book about if you're in conflict with somebody, how can you use that for your own growth instead of turning on trying to change them? Really, how can you welcome that? Woo! Yeah. We are not taught those skills in this culture. Yeah. I would imagine, actually, when you think about it for the long, long term, learning the permaculture skills, learning how to grow things, learning how to think ecologically, learning how to communicate in these ways are going to be as important as the ABCs. Right. As mathematics, right. you know. So, so one of the images I have is that this peak oil stuff is very scary to people. And when people are just flat out frightened, they tend to either put their heads in the sand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or um, well, basically they just function. It's like deer in the headlights. Yes. And so what I want to do is, yeah, scare them a little bit so that they're motivated to change. <laughs> but then um, how to make it really joyful, how to really say, okay, given all of this, we can create wonderful, fun lives with each other. And um, ah. so my focus is on the joy part. There's plenty of people out there spreading the, the actual facts, and they do it better than I, and they're doing an important job. But I feel like where my gifts are is, okay, now we're all scared. How can we really party together? Party? <laughs> I mean, now that... 
<laughs> you, got, you got me speechless because here's Richard Heinberg writing a book saying, the party's over. No, this folks, is a different right? party. <laughs> we got a new party coming yes, here. Yes, exactly. Tell me about this. Tell me your vision and so, how do you um, infect people with that joy. So Medea, and Benjamin, Medea Benjamin and Kevin Danaher actually came up with the image of um, the Titanic sinking, or maybe they didn't, but they popularized it for me. Okay. And this other competing ship coming up, and everybody, it's a permaculture ship, it's beautiful. Ah. And everybody's dancing on board, and they're eating really healthy food, and they're having a great time, and the people on the sinking ship, they're not going to think twice about jumping from that ship well, to that ship. Well, that's true. So you're providing yeah. a healthy, joyful, wonderful right. alternative. Right. Even in the midst of the transition that we're because all going Because it's very through. clear to me that all of us driving around in our individual cars and going to our corporate jobs in order to support the lifestyle that's ruining the planet, we're not really happy doing that. That's so true. I I'm so way true. happier the more I simplify. So the less money I make, the more time I have to connect with my friends, the more music I make, the more dancing I do. The more time I take for the garden so that I can eat really healthy food, I feel better. So what you're doing is living right. that new life. Right. So I'm doing two things. One is living it and exploring it and having fun with that. And the other is educating people that kind of reaching out a hand and saying, come along on this venture. And, and so is the, is the theater taking, breaking the boundaries down between your audience and your entertainers. That's part of your way you want to transmit this. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just education because we're in a culture that people want to be entertained or used to right. being entertained. And I love entertaining. And so, and I do it well. I mean, I'm a musician and my partner writes songs that are funny. And, and so we don't want to get rid of that, but we also want to change places. It's like there's three steps to learning. This is my idea anyway, or borrowed from someplace, of course, where you you impart information. That's one step. Okay. And then there's a middle step where it's, and this is where most people don't do it, is people have to sit with it. They have to mm -hmm. sit quietly mm -hmm. in their own space. They can either take a walk by a river, or if you're in a workshop context, you put on really mellow music, and you have them close their eyes for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and you maybe repeat the information. So there's that kind of... Um, to digest it, to digest take it, it. In, into themselves. And yes. then the third step is they've got to do something with it, even if it's to argue with it. They will mm -hmm. take it home if they've actually actively engaged with it. So whenever I design an event, I want to have those three pieces. Because if you engage with it, I think that's... I think there's clue because you can't just then bury your head in the sand, right. deny the whole thing, or try to deny the whole thing. It's and there's emotional process. Whatever it is that your content you're giving, if you're giving the scary content, then the active engagement part will be emotional processing for people to share what comes up for them and, and feel the community of the people around them and they can start seeing hopeful things to do or whatever. Or if they're not at that phase, we're doing something else, then there's so many things to do. Well, when, you, when, you're, when you're doing things and encouraging people to bring up their responses, what are you finding that people, I mean, what's typical for people's responses to this whole peak oil news? Um, as far as the sea stars go, we just birthed it. So we okay. haven't had so a lot of experience yet. yet. Yeah. Though I have... Um, Which is the name you have for this theater, the theater this without idea. boundaries kind of idea. No, I have taught workshops. Like I have this green economics workshop that I taught at the university and at the permaculture gathering. And then I did this whole thing. And people came up. It was in a university setting. I had them all lie down on the floor. <laughs> and I had this like music going and this repeating thing. And they got up. And after the three-hour class, they said, this is the best class we've ever had. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I'm such a good talker, because I'm not, but it was that, that flow of the whole thing that really works. Well, I think what you did, in the very least, was you gave people the permission and the space that's safe to go into their feelings, which we don't have in mm -hmm. our culture overall. And I think that um, that part of the human potential movement, whatever name you want to give it, that's, that's I'm happy to see spreading into more and more contexts, is a big part of our, what do I call it? Um, big part of who we all are that's been ignored. Mm -hmm. So I salute what you're doing. And that's a good reminder to groups to include, like Joanna Macy does, include mm -hmm. the feeling side mm -hmm. here so that people can feel. And then when you find people getting ideas about what they can do in response, because I'm with you, it's like, well, then do something. Because doing something makes us feel, that you feel makes a difference mm -hmm. in some way, even if it's tiny, right. makes you feel good. Right. And you want to do more of that. Right. Do you find that happening, that people are starting to do little things you may not know from a workshop because of whether it changes their lives later. I can say that in Eugene, there's a group of people who are aware of what's going on. I don't consider us very numerous at this point. Mm -hmm. Though mm -hmm. a thousand people did show up to, it was sold out to see Richard Heinberg. That's impressive. Yeah. In a town of how many? How, many, how big is Eugene? 150,000 probably in the area. Uh -huh. 
Okay. So it's, and I know that some of the people showed up at our um, post carbon Eugene meetings after that, and they felt discouraged and in despair. So the question is how to catch them. We mm -hmm. weren't mobilized at that okay. point, and a lot of the work I'm doing now is in response to that group not functioning very well. How did that, what was that like? Basically, in my opinion, it was like, well, first we were a self-study group, and then people got tired of that because they wanted to move into action, but there didn't have any of these tools of communication, conflict resolution, um, touchy-feely stuff. It was mostly men, mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and it fell apart, in my opinion, over not being able to handle conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so my response is, how are we going to get groups functional from the beginning to hold space for women so they want to be there? Because we're definitely a lot of the worker bees. That's right. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. In a lot of cultures, yeah. we are the prime worker mm -hmm. bees. Well, we're the ones that are building community. Right. Right. With family, with friends, and so on. And you have those social skills to make those networks. Mm -hmm. Which in, a, in, a, in some folks are feeling, that's our bottom line. I mean, we may or may not know how to garden, but if we know how to work together, we'll, go, we'll find what we need mm -hmm. to learn and we'll do. Well, you need cohesion to mm -hmm. do that. That's a real important part. And your group didn't yet have that, those skills sort of as a common ground. And there was no agreement. We didn't come together with any agreement that we were going to be an action group. Uh -huh. and, and we just didn't make it over that hump to, to move into that area. Mm -hmm. Though maybe they did. Maybe I just dropped out. Maybe it's still happening. I don't know. Okay. But what I do know is that there's a group, a core group of 20, 30 people in Eugene that are orienting their life, dedicating their life to doing stuff. And you're going to meet with a handful of them. That's exciting. So I won't, I won't spill the beans on their projects too much. That's fine. I mean, just, <laughs> but know. just, I mean, that's, so your, your work is now heading into the Sea Stars use of theater entertainment. Right. So when we, get, when we come back, we'll have to just videotape something happening by that time. Yeah. Now you mentioned you've done a skit. You've written a yes. skit. Tell us about so this. So my skit was called The Three Little Pigs Meet the Peak Oil Wolf and I probably wrote it a couple years ago and it's been performed ten times in Oregon probably and everywhere I go people want to copy the script and I'm happy to pass it out to people. What I'm noticing now is it's getting modified like it's being performed again at the Oregon Country Fair this year but they've added music to it and they're, yeah, yeah. they're just dolling it has a it life up. of its own, huh? Yeah, which is well, really beautiful. Well, what happens? Come on now. You've okay, gotta, so you there's three these. little pigs <laughs> and the first little pig is your socialite, socialite McMansion pig who's like in total denial and the second little pig is your survivalist pig who's individually trying to take care of himself mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. third little pigs are the permatopia permaculture pigs who are like creating viable alternatives for not only themselves but for the community. So in the um, so then ten years later peak oil is hit and the socialite pig is saying, oh my god, I'm blindsided, I don't know what's going on. So she's heard that the survivalist pig has food. So she goes up to him and he shoots her <laughs> off stage. Oh, dear. And then he eats her up. But at, at the end he's just kind of lonely and tired of eating his fellow mm. pig. So he go, goes off and finds the permatopia pigs who take him in on the condition that he learns what he can for a year, apprentice for a year, and then take it back out to the community aha, he came from. Aha. So he gets kind of converted. So he doesn't get to be the, the lone wolf or the lone, lone pig. pig right? <laughs> and, the, and the wolf in the story is basically a peak oil educator who like, wanders around. And he's kind of a nice guy. Like he, people are scared of him at first, but then they realize he's got a big heart. He's just kind of got this scary exterior. That sounds fun. Have you, yeah. oh, I, I can imagine. How long, how long is this skit? Oh, it's probably 20 minutes. That sounds like a, I mean, that's a first that I've heard of, you know, a piece of the new culture that's, that's, that's using, you know, literature and music and play and fun and acting, all that. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm writing a skit um, called The Red Hen, and it's, it's addressing this idea of how do we get the work done, because there's a heck of a lot of work that needs to absolutely. be done, and people just aren't doing it. And again, it's come back to this idea of taking this old story, which is the red hand does it by herself and then eats it by herself. Now, that's not going to cut it. In we making are, the bread, right. right. She asks she does all know, the steps. who will mill it and who will right. gather it and who will... And nobody know, helps, so she eats so it she, by herself. Right. And that, and that not is not going to work. No. So we've changed the story, and now, yeah, people turn her down. There's the mom, the daughter, and the SUV who drive up. They're always hurried on the way, and at the very end, I'll tell you what happens. But, but along the way, finally, people start joining in and having a blast. They massage each other. They sing songs. They tell each other their life stories. They get all this work done in a really joyful way. And at the end, these two um, women come up, the mother and the daughter, and they're invited to join in after all, even though they didn't do any of the work. 
Uh -huh. and, and yet they notice everybody's having a great time and they feel a little guilty. And so at the end they say, well, we'll do the dishes. And suddenly they're incorporated into the that's workflow right. too. So that's kind of a, an invitation to people that it's not so bad working. I think that, I think, you know, when I think about how the automobile has given us both, well, and fossil fuel, mobility, but it has also shredded our social fabric. Mm -hmm. Since, you know, what, 100 years ago, most people knew, walk, took the horse, whatever, carriage, and, and we're in a, a much smaller locality. And that, so do you think that vision of, that, that many of the peak oil educators have, that we have to re-localize, do you think that, that really fits? Do you have any sense of how? Well, doing it bit by bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see little neighborhoods. I'm, have you got any This neighborhood here is my Trey Eco Village, and we have 30 people living on less than an acre. And some of us With gardens. With plenty of gardens. With and chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so you walk in, and people just jaw drop how beautiful it is. You'll see it later. And, and yet we have people tucked into every corner. We've got people living up in little attic spaces and little cardboard domes. and. Just, you know, we tuck them in and we have a little work, we have work parties regularly to get the work done together. So you're a model, you're living in, a mm -hmm. model of, of all, an, both an alternate living space, alternate social patterns, because you have to at least get along enough to do work parties to, to for and your And we place. share all the same tools and mm -hmm. we have one wood mm -hmm. shop that we mm -hmm. share and mm -hmm. we just share so much, you know, the, the washing machines, you name it. That's... I mean, which means you're all doing a smaller footprint because right. if you're sharing one washing machine, it's like we just read recently from uh, Barry Lopez the notion that divorce in America is, a, is required because the consumerist corporate world needs all those separate households to, f to furnish, right. to, buy, to sell their products. It's like, wait a minute, and wait we a minute, it's the counter to coming together. And we community. do it the other way. We have little people, people who say, we really want to live there here. And they, we say, well, we have a little corner here. Build yourself a dome and you can be sponsored by our bathroom and kitchen. So we have like <laughs> regular households that have like six little or out, ten people that out, are all... Outbuildings. Uh -huh, now, for their bedrooms. Is there a zoning? I was going to ask about it's this. It's not legal. Okay. And um, hopefully nobody's going to... Trust us because in. of this yes, particular well, advertising, but we're not going to tell you where this is. But basically, yes. as long as the neighbors like us, which mostly they do, uh -huh. um, the city actually loves us. They know that we're doing great experimentation around building materials, and they know it's needed. And okay, so they know we're ahead of the curve, and they're not inclined to bust us unless they have to because a neighbor complains. And so you're, and and actually, that's a big part of this is being on good terms with those neighbors, right. because. Because, in a sense, you want some of these ideas to spread to the neighborhood right. when people are ready for that, to, right. have, to take down the fences. Right. And that's what I see, is to take down the fences, share the growing area, take off the driveways, take out the asphalt, and begin to grow, on things, grow things again. We had a driveway here last summer, and I came back from the permaculture course, and I said, that driveway doesn't belong here. What is a self-respecting eco-village doing with a driveway? <laughs> so we started, we have all these visitors come through just randomly, especially in the summertime, and it just was this work party for two weeks. And first we tried to do it by hand, and then I ended up renting a jackhammer for two, you know, for a day, really, and busted up all the concrete, and it took us two weeks to get it out of there and find good soil and put it in, and I can't tell you how much fun it was. So it was kind of like a barn raising. So my imagining is that we could do that all up and down the streets here, is take out driveways and lawns and do it together and Make a party out and of it. And then find ways, I suppose, you'd have to, to think about, I mean, the, the communities of the future. Where do you park vehicles, the shared vehicles, mm -hmm. routes for handicapped folks to be mm -hmm. able to, you know, little motorized scooters or mm -hmm. whatever it is to be able to... Emergency to vehicles. Places, of course, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Well, it looks, I mean, that's a creative whole area mm -hmm. that we're going to have to create together. Yeah. So in our last, we have about three minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has been such fun. Is there anything that you know you wanted to share that we haven't gotten to? Gosh. I think we got what? everywhere. You have a, you, you're just going to join on, on board a new, a, a new group, is that right? An institute, a new culture? Let's see. Oh, yeah, I'm about to join the board of the New Culture Institute. And they have really been my teachers for the communication skills piece of it. I've learned it from everywhere. But they are an amazing group that are really shifting how we relate to each other in a deeper mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And what I have here, I, I have so many different groups of friends. Some are my permaculture friends, but there's this group of friends 
that we're intimate with in the sense that we know what's going on in each other's lives. I was just reading in the newspaper today that the number, the average number of people that are intimate in each other's lives has gone down from four to like two average in this country. And there's lots of people who have zero people that they're connected with that they can share what's going on in their lives. Mm. So this New mm. Culture Institute is really turning that around. They have, oh, one little communication tool is called the forum and everybody sits in a circle and one person goes in the middle and just starts walking around and saying what's going on for them. It's simple. It's so it's basic. It's simple, but on the other hand, for some people it will be very we, threatening. You have to make it safe. Mm -hmm. You have to make it, you know, people know that their privacy is respected, that whatever they say. I've, I've done groups, mm -hmm. been in groups like that. I think it's, it's more that, that the people who do feel safe go in the center and the people who don't, don't. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then over time, the people in, in the outskirts say, oh, nothing really horrible happened to that person. I, I, I think I'm going to get up and go in there. <laughs> and then they realize how good it feels when they don't carry secrets and when there's people uh, who really know yeah. who they are. It's one of the most healing things to be, to be witnessed caringly. Mm -hmm. Just, I, I care to hear yeah. what's in your story, what's in your heart. Right. So. so this group puts on a summer camp for two weeks every summer, and that's actually how I discovered Oregon. Is I discovered this camp on the Internet and came out to it, and I love them so much, and a lot of them live in Eugene. Ah. So I already had oh. a friendship network when I showed up here. That's really nice. So you yeah. had your, your social web already yeah. here for you. Yeah. Okay, so in our last minute, visions. Do you have any visions for what you'd hope to happen in, in this city that you love? Well, gosh, just spread out, do more eco-village type, type mm. stuff, mm. Um, really downsize our consumption, uh, convert the lawns and driveways, what else? Um, find businesses. We're pretty low economics here. There's not much in the way of jobs, but there's so many jobs that could be done in terms of producing food and producing clothing and producing energy. and Everything that needs to happen in a low fossil fuel environment, it takes labor. And so really yeah. to educate each of us on how, you know, what, what does our heart call us to yes. do? There was some book I read many decades ago about how each of us have our own passions. We're placed on the earth with our own interests and there's a place for all of us. And we can all joyfully, some of us even love to clean bathrooms. So mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. really a, a joyful place for us all to contribute. And the trick in living is to figure out what that is. That's great. Thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Melanie, for joining me. Thank you. This is Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Join us for another episode as we learn how communities are responding to a, an energy-declining future. Thanks for watching.